Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part four in the Southwest Technical Products Corporation 6800 Computer System video series. It's a real mouthful to say all of that. As is usual with my video series where there's multiple parts, I always put links to all the other parts in the description below. So I recommend you watch parts one through three before you watch this part, because of course, as usual, I just sort of pick up right where I left off on the last one. On part three, I worked to get the 4K RAM expansion board working, or at least tested. It turned out, spoiler alert, that there was a bad RAM chip on that board, so I could use half of it 2K, but unfortunately, 2K is not really enough. So in this video, I'm going to test out not only the 16K RAM card that also came inside this computer, but I'm also going to show off a little homebrew RAM card that I made myself. I'm also going to test out a ROM upgrade and a few other things on this machine. So without further ado, let's get right to it. And we're gonna jump right into part four. I had just finished testing the two slash 4K RAM board in the last part, and I figured out that it had a bad RAM chip, so now, I wanna show off a little homemade RAM board that I made myself. Now, this chip is probably expensive and hard to find, and in reality, I don't really need this card to work, and here's why. Well, actually, there are two reasons. There's this card, which has 16K, which we haven't tested, but may work, but it also may not. It's already had two chips changed out on it. But I actually just designed my own RAM board for this thing, which I figured was kind of in the spirit of this old machine. And here it is, right here. This is the Adrian Black Special Edition Homebrew RAM Expansion Board with a ROM expansion for the Southwest Technical Products Corporation 6800 Personal Computer, or computer system. <laughs> what I decided to do, and I'll flip this over, you can see that I hand-wired it all, <laughs> is that I knew that I needed to be able to replace the ROM on the CPU card with the newer SWITBUG, SWT, bug instead of the original Motorola MIC bug. And the reason why is SWITBUG has a lot of extra and better features. But one of the big ones about SWITBUG is that it supports not only this 300 bits per second bitbang card, but the serial card. And I had mentioned already that I did test the serial card and that was because I did test this already. I know that this works. The benefit of using the serial card is A, it's a real serial port, so you don't get that problem with the junk when you type letters full duplex, but also it supports higher baud rates. Right out of the box, it supports up to 1200 bits per second or, or baud. And here's the card right here. And remember, 1200 baud, which was really the next evolution when it came to like modems over 300, is four times faster. So loading a program, if I'm pasting it through the terminal emulator, is four times faster as well. That is massive. But even better is that it has these unused signals here for like 600 and 110 bits per second that come off the motherboard. Well, remember how I mentioned on the CPU card, and I'm gonna pull this out, there's a clock generator. I think this is it right here. This generates the baud rates and it actually is what connects to the motherboard here and sends like the 300 baud or 600 baud or 1200 baud clock signals to the serial card. Well, there are extra baud rates available on this chip. And what people tell you to do, and even this Switbug bug manual tells you to do this, is you cut a trace on here for like 600 baud and you run a jumper wire for 9600 baud to the 600 baud pin on the connector. And then on the serial card here, when you set it for 600 baud, when I set the dip switch appropriately, it's actually running at 9600 baud. <laughs> now, at the time this machine was made in 1975, 9600 baud was not really a thing, not for like any person at home to have. That would be way too expensive. People would be using this with like old teletypes, which were 110, I think. Maybe a serial terminal at 300. Like that stuff was very expensive. So 9600 baud was a pipe dream. But Motorola thought ahead, so the serial chip supports it and the clock generator, and that's a quick and simple mod you can do. Now, I haven't done that particular mod yet, but I got ready by making this board here that has the ROM that can run at that speed with that serial board. There are some additional features that this ROM brings over the original ROM, which is this one, that are pretty cool. This is a 1K ROM chip. Now I actually have a 2716, which is a 2K ROM chip in there, but it could fit in a 2708. I'm not using the upper half, 
Luckily, the select logic, and I think I mentioned this earlier on in the video, the chip select logic for this ROM actually is mapped into the upper 8K of memory space on this machine. Again, strange things. I think that was forward thinking on Motorola's part, but I still don't know why they put this ROM all the way down at E000 because they're wasted basically that top 8K of memory space on this machine. So my little expansion board here, originally I was just gonna do the ROM and I had these two TTL logic chips to select it. The original ROM chip on the CPU card has four chip select lines and basically uh, you need to combine those together and then invert it because uh, this is selected um, when things are high. And of course an EEPROM needs a low chip select line. So there's an inverter and then a quad AND gate. Now, I could have used a single NAND gate, but I went with two because that allowed me to add this RAM chip. And yes, this board right here adds the EEPROM, the chip select logic, and it adds this right here, which is a 32K SRAM chip that comes from, I think, a 4D6 or a 3D6 cache board. And all I needed to do was wire it into the address and data bus lines, add this pin header here with these extra wires that basically get the extra address lines because the socket on the motherboard or the, the CPU card here only has address lines, I think, A0 through A, um, what is it, A9 maybe? And this, of course, needs all the way to address line 14 and I need to use address line 15 as well as a chip select line because when address line 15, which is the highest address line on this particular processor, when address line 15 is low, that means that the CPU is addressing the lower 32K of memory space. So in that case, that plus the clock signal, uh, phi two being high should turn on this RAM chip. So I did that with this logic. I just kind of worked it out in my head that's what all this wiring is down here. But the cool benefit of this is this plugs in right here to the ROM socket. And then you just have to connect these extra pins here to this board. And then that enables 32K RAM expansion right on the CPU card and it replaces the ROM at the same time. So it really means that I don't need to use that, that 4K RAM board right here with the bad RAM chip. I just don't need this. I still could use this 16K card though. And the reason why is because one of the dip switch settings on here maps this up into, uh, what's the address space this maps it up into? It maps it up into like A1000, and that gives me 48K total between this board with my little homemade thing and this would give me all the RAM possible that this machine needs. Now remember when I was doing the diagnostics on the other card, I was entering memory locations for what to test into A002. That is mapped to this chip right here. That's the, that's the 128 bit or byte static RAM that the uh, monitor ROM uses. If I map this card here into A1000, that's the same space as this. So I would need to disable this. And there's a simple mod you can do on the CPU card to turn that off. And then this would become the memory space used by the, the boot ROM for the little diagnostics or whatever, the machine language monitor. But that all that memory is also available for other things like operating systems and stuff like that. So let's hook my little board up to the CPU card here. Give that a test. So all we gotta do is pop this original PROM out, which is a Motorola MCM6830. This is a mask ROM made by Motorola. And then we have to plug this in. Now where to connect these wires? I soldered on little pin headers here and there on this board. There's one underneath it, which is right here. And then there's these right here. Here's my photograph to help me connect it up. What's kind of cool on these PCBs, because they're made for hand assembly, is that the vias that are on here that go on the traces between the two sides of the board are so big, you can just stick a normal pin right through it. The one problem is not all of the address lines I need are actually on all the vias. So some of them I had to actually solder the pin right onto the IC leg, which is what you see going on here. Now there's one other mod you have to do to this, which would be the same if I had the original Switbug, bug, which is the one that um, Southwest sold. You could do an upgrade yourself. It's the same exact chip as this. And this is actually a 1K mask ROM, but they're only using 512. So on the back, there was a trace right here that went to ground. And that's one of the address lines. You need to actually hook it up to this via right here, which connects the leg of the IC to, I think, address line nine. So I'd already gone ahead and I cut that trace, which is what you see right there. And I have that bodge. Now it's currently grounded. So it's restoring what I cut. 
because to use the original ROM, like I was doing in the original demo just now, I had to have that like that. But I'm just gonna quickly move that over back so I get the correct address line. And we should be back in business with 32K and the replacement ROM. Now I'm pretty pleased with myself because I have to say, I think that the spirit of doing it by hand like this is very much what people would do in the old days with these machines. And of course, me getting the original SWIT ROM or SWIT bug would be impossible. And the pinout of this mask ROM and an EEPROM, which is pretty common these days, is completely different. So even just to use the EEPROM, like I said, I would have had to do all this entire board anyways. And I thought, oh, I already had space. I actually started designing this with just the ROM in mind. But then I left that space up there and I thought, oh, there's enough room for this um, SRAM chip. Let me add it. I wouldn't even need any other logic. So anyways, that's what I did. Okay, we should be good to go. I'm gonna pop this back in. And this machine, all of a sudden, not only will have the better ROM, but will have 32K of RAM in the lower memory space. All right, so here we go. We used to have a asterisk prompt. I'm gonna turn the machine on and there we go. Dollar sign prompt. That implies that that ROM is totally working. Well, now, if we go to the M command, now the syntax is a little bit different now. I think there it is, FF, let me see, 12, 13, 14, 15, Okay, I just hit enter to exit out of that. Yeah, it's a little bit changed up the way it works. They made some massive improvements. But if we go to M and we go to 0000, we should see that we have the actual stuff I stored in there, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Now what's cool is I've actually gone ahead and I ran those RAM diagnostics, like the various ones we saw, and I let them run through fully. I was really pleased when I did those diagnostics and this machine was rock solid stable, even after running for hours, not a problem. Now, theoretically, it's possible to take a card like this and cut the select lines that go from the select logic here to these RAM chips, right? So they would no longer be selected. And to take those and to like end them all together and then basically wire in a chip like that, that 32K chip into this board, you just deadhead it into here, you would get 16K and would replace all of this with a single chip. But I do want to see if this board actually works because I would like to have that in that upper memory location above this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop out this SRAM chip that's in here because we don't need it right now because uh, I need to test this in the lower memory location where this SRAM lives. So to, to disable it, all I literally need to do is just remove it from the board. And then this is no longer a RAM expansion board. Oops, I just bent up the pins. Whoops, I'll fix that in a second. Just to make sure this is still stuck in the socket properly. Okay, and let's take this. And I looked up the dip switches, by the way which are right here, and switch two, three, four, and five are all set currently to the down position, which is address 0000. So that's where this memory board is going to be located. Let's pop that in. All right, so we got our dollar sign prompt. Now let's just do a quick test with the M command. Let's just see if it's even responding to memory reads or writes, that is. Uh, let's put in our 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, oops. Okay, so see that little extra messed up character? That's because I'm still using the BitBang console card. It's not a problem, it didn't ruin anything, but I need to switch over the serial card now that that new ROM is in here. All right, this is back to 0000. We got 12, 13, 14. I think the next one didn't work. Yeah, 80, I didn't. Okay, so this card appears to be working at least to a rudimentary level. Let's switch over to the serial card here so we can get some 1200 baud action. Now I haven't done that mod for 9600 baud, but uh, totally is possible. The console card here can be retained with this new ROM. It just needs to move to slot zero. And, and then we put in slot one, the serial board. I'm actually gonna move over the connector as well. So the, the console port on the back where it says control is still the same, but I can plug in this other serial port into the other card. Luckily, these two cards have exactly the same serial pinout on the back of the machine here. I do need to go and switch the serial port to 1200 from 300. There we go, we got the dollar sign again, but we are running now 1200 baud, four times the speed, warp speed action. All right, so let's go right for this first test, memory convergence test. I think it's the quickest to run. And we do hit L just like we did before, and we hit paste, and we hit okay, and it's gonna go much quicker. Now we still have to set those memory locations as we did before. So we are gonna start the memory test at 0000, 
the first 32K of memory is from all zeros to 8,000. Well, it's actually one less than 8,000. So 7 FFFF, which is what we were testing before. So we're going to do half of 8,000, which is 4,000, but it's one less. So it's 3 FFF, which as you can see, is exactly what I typed in. So now we hit G for go, and we're getting X's. Darn it. So that means that this board has RAM problems as well. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to change those memory locations. I'm going to test less of this card. Let's do it in 4K increments. See if we can figure out which bank on here has the problem. So we're going to test to 0FFF, which is the top of the first bank, which is the first 4K of memory here. And we hit G. And look, we're getting hash symbols. So at least with this test, the first bank of memory is working. And now we're going to test from 1000 to 1FFF. And we're going to hit go. And right there, we're getting an X. So I'm assuming that means that it's bank 2 that is bad. Let's just write that down on a piece of paper. I think the documentation has pretty good information on the, the layout of those chips. So bank one has a check mark. Bank two has an X. Let's, let's keep going. And now we're gonna test from 2000 to 2FFF. And we're gonna hit G. Uh-oh. It's also saying there's a problem in bank uh, three. I mean, maybe I should have labeled it zero, one, two, three, but whatever, we know, we know what that means. Bank three got an X. Okay, and now we're going to test from 3000 to 3FFF, and we're going to hit G, and G looks like it's good. So we have problems in the middle two banks, at least with this particular test. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to run those other RAM tests through these two banks, one and four, and just make sure that those test out good before we try to identify which chips are bad with those banks. Okay, the RAM check is done. Here are the results. So bank one completely does the memory convergence and that CDAT test perfectly, as does bank four. Bank two and three fail the memory convergence as we saw earlier, and CDAT fails as well. So looking at the error codes for the CDAT test, uh, bank two here, memory address 1BC2, I have found that bit seven is always stuck on. And um, in bank three, it reported the error at 2FC0, bit four was stuck on. Um, but it also I noticed the memory locations that are near it are stuck in the same way. And the way I was figuring that out is uh, you can see right here in the memory monitor, 1BCF, which is this one right here, if I tried to write 00 to it, it would print a question mark because it compared what it just wrote to what it reads back. And it always reads back as 80. We bring up the calculator, hex 80 is bit seven right there. You can see the binary. I did that same testing for these other memory locations and uh, they show the same thing. Now, if we bring up the documentation for this memory card right here, here's the memory map. Now it does say uh, 1000, it's very hard to read, 1000 through one FFF, bit uh, seven is what we're looking for. It's IC16, so I'm just gonna write that on here. IC16, and we know bit four is the problem on this other bank right here. So bit four is IC21, IC21. Um, well, it would be helpful if there were IC markings on here. <laughs> and there aren't. This is terrible. <laughs> there's no markings on here, and there's no map in the documentation either. It just shows uh, these ICs here, and there's the map. Maybe it talks about it here. Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> this is terrible. Talks about how the card works, which is all very nice, but there is absolutely nothing about the map. That's it, M16A, which is what this is, installation instructions. All right, well, it starts at IC1, and it goes all the way through 32. All right, so I guess this is laid out in some kind of a grid. We can look at the data lines here, so that goes back to this IC. Okay, I can't tell. Where? So let's look at this one. Okay, this uh, this data line goes up to this IC on pin three, which down here is the data bit line. So U1, 9, 17, and 25. So that would imply if this was it here, pin three. I don't know which chip is which though. Uh, this other one here, pin three goes to U5. Well, I don't think it's gonna be that because that would be this one here. So I'm gonna say that this is gonna be U1, or IC1, and that's data bit zero. Let's just draw a one here, and we'll draw an eight right here. 
So the two bad ICs we're looking for, IC16. So that's going to be that one, potentially, <laughs> if the uh, if I'm right with the, the, the way I've reverse engineered it. And uh, 21, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. That one right there. And unfortunately, neither of those are socketed. I don't have these chips anyways. These are TMS uh, 4044s, kind of an unusual static RAM chip. Anyways, it's going to be 4K times one bit. I definitely don't have anything that is compatible with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of these static RAM chips. I just happen to have another 32K one here, and I'm going to hotwire the chip in. I'll be right back with the mod completed. I wouldn't say this is super pretty, but I actually decided to do it in a way that didn't modify this board at all. Well, the only modification is I actually desoldered this 74 or LS138 from the board so I could socket it. And the reason why I did that is because this is the chip that selects the four banks of memory on this board. And I needed to interrupt the signal that comes from this chip and pull it up to five volts so this RAM would be disabled, but I still needed access to the select lines on that chip because that is what enables the RAM chip that I added to the board right here. So I have a little stack of sockets where I cut those four pins and on the lower socket that's plugged into the circuit board here, all of those chip select lines are at five volts. So that disables the RAM. And then the four chip select lines do come off and they go into this, which is a quad and gate. It's one of these chips right here. It's just what I happen to have. So this has four separate and gates within it. And the reason I need that is because we're going from four banks of RAM to one bank of RAM, just one chip. And I need all the chip select lines for the four banks to be combined into one chip select line to turn this chip on when any of the four banks are being accessed. So I cascaded two of these AND gates for the four chip select lines, and then the output of both of them goes into another one of these AND gates, and the output of that is what goes to the RAM chip. Now, they're stuck on the board with just some double-sided thermal tape on top of the other chips that are on there, and they're held on pretty well, but they are in sockets. If I turn it sideways, you can see there, the chips are removable, so I can pull the socket off, I have to change the chip out, nothing is soldered onto those chips, both of these right here. In addition to lighten the load on this voltage regulator, I removed the two RAM chips that were in the sockets. These two actually work fine, but I just removed them anyways. This is a data sheet for that static RAM that was on this board. And I ended up using almost all of the signals that are on this uh, socket here, including the VSS and VCC. So that's ground and five volts. The only thing I really didn't use is uh, there are two data pins. So C, D and Q, these are actually wired up together. So I only need to hook up to one of those. And then the chip select line on this RAM socket here, I didn't use that because of course, all the chip select lines for all this RAM is pulled up to five volts on my little socket stack here. I did connect to the data bit that is on this socket though. So I guess uh, that is, uh, this is zero and that's seven. So this is data bit five, but I need to pick up the rest of the data bits. And that's what's going on up here. So see, there's some wires that I soldered onto this chip and the one that's underneath the AND gate here, there are four wires there and there are three on that one because that extra uh, bit, the eighth bit is being picked up off of this socket right here. And then the last thing I need to do to make this particular mod work is this RAM chip here needed extra address lines. Here's the data sheet for a particular chip just like this. I mean, this looks like it's a wide package, but it's the same exact pinout as this chip here. So 71256. Now, if you look at the address lines here, it goes all the way up to address line 14. Remember, this is a 32K chip, and I only want to use half of it, so 16K. So I actually grounded A14, or the 14th address line, which just makes sure that that part of this RAM chip is never used. And when we look at this chip here, you can see there's A0 through A11, but on this chip, we actually need 13 and 12 to be also picked up. So there's 13, and there's 12. And I actually picked those up on a chip underneath this little bird's nest here. You can't really see it but those lines are soldered onto a couple legs on the IC, I think that's uh, right there. That's it, that's the mod. This board is fully restored to a full 16K and it should be super reliable. I know I could have sourced the replacement SRAM for it and fixed the bad chips, but I don't think that would have made a super reliable board in the long term. These SRAM chips are very reliable and they're extremely easy to get and are very plentiful. I have a ton myself. So if ever that chip fails for some reason, then I can just swap it out and then I'll have another 16K. Now, what I like about this mod is all the chip select logic is still the original stuff that was on this board, which means that these dip switches will completely work 
as they were before. That gives me the flexibility to place this anywhere in the system. So when I reinstall the original 32K chip that I had on the CPU board there, then this can be set to not overlap and I'll get that full 48K. So I'm just gonna reinstall this 32K RAM chip into the CPU board here. Oops, that popped out. And now I can change these switches so that this exists in the A1000 space right here from A1000 to DFFF. It says we need up, down, up, and down. Okay, now before we do that mod though, we have to disable this um, 128 bytes SRAM here because that does overlap with this memory board now. Now it talks about this, to use the M16 at this location is necessary to make the following modifications to the CPU board. This is really hard to read. Cut tape foil between pin six, 10 and 13 of IC16 on the board. Add a jumper between IC7 pin six and IC16 pin 13. It's not necessary to remove this. Okay, so now we have three bodges on the back of this board but it's all necessary for the feature improvements that we're gonna be bringing to this machine. So one thing to consider is when I put the CPU card back in here now, the computer is not gonna boot at all with the, without the RAM board installed. It's just not gonna work. Even though there's 32K of RAM on this board, the fact that that 128 is disabled is gonna prevent this from even turning on. So let's just give it a try with these mods. Yep, nothing, as expected. Now let's install this RAM board with the bird's nest on it. And I've already set those uh, switches. So it should be operating up in that A space. And now when we turn it on, look at that. We get a dollar sign. There is now memory up like say at B1000, uh, 12, 13, 14, and there never used to be. MB1000, there it is. 12, 13, 14, 15, sweet. So that brings this computer right up to full 48K of RAM, which means I'm technically now capable of running operating systems like Flex. And um, let's try a basic on here. All right, here's a copy of Microsoft Basic. Now this was originally designed for the Altair uh, 680, which is an Altair that uses the Motorola 6800. And then someone created a patch here and it says requires memory 8000. I put that because I realized I couldn't use this until I had the RAM working. And that's because the Altair has a slightly different ROM layout and uh, the IO cards I think are slightly different as well. So it just patches a couple of routines in basic to make it work. Now I've never tested this, so let's give it a try. So here it is, it's a much longer program than those RAM tests we've been using. So clearly uh, this is gonna take longer to load and would really benefit from the 9600 baud. But uh, let's just try it as is right here. So I'm gonna hit paste and there it is. And now we wait. Alrighty, there it is, it finished loading. When it's done, it just uh, drops to the dollar sign prompt. If there was a problem, like a checksum error, uh, you get a little, I think a question mark or something like that that tells you it didn't load properly. We do need to load the patch here. So let's open this and you can see it's nice and short. So let's copy this and we'll do L again. We'll paste this in. There it is. To start this basic, you have to do J and 0000. zero, zero, zero. It's different for whatever reason, you can't just type G like you can with other programs. I think this is because this came from the MITS uh, Altair 680 machine, as opposed to being designed for this machine specifically. Memory size, if you just push enter, it's supposed to be able to size RAM itself, but I found that it doesn't really work properly if you do that. So I'm gonna just type in 30,000. Terminal width 80, do you want sine, cosine, uh, tangent, arc tangent? Um, I don't know, sure, yes. Okay, there we go. 10, print, hello world. Uh, okay, so it said syntax error and now it just sort of froze up. This is something I have seen happen before. If I reset the machine and jump back to the start of basic, uh, yeah, it just sort of is weirdly frozen and corrupted. And I don't know why, sometimes it loads properly and other times it doesn't. So I'm just gonna reload it again. My only thought as to what's going on is maybe if the RAM has a little bit of garbage in it from when you power the machine up, that the Altair Basic really has a problem with that. Maybe like the RAM needs to be completely cleared out first. I'm not totally sure, but I do know that sometimes this works perfectly and other times it just does this. 
I just had a thought as well, as I keep reloading basic into this thing. Oh, it just finished. Maybe I need to do the mod to switch this to 9600 baud just so it loads a whole lot faster. Let's uh, try this one more time. And if I have to reload it one more time, yeah, I'm gonna do that mod. Okay, the patch is loaded again. So jump to four zeros. Uh, let's try memory size of, I don't know, 30,000 again. Why don't we just do terminal width? I'll just push enter on that and we'll do no for that. Maybe the cosine stuff is what's causing problems. 10 print low list. Nope, that just froze immediately. Let's restart basic again. Print hello. And it froze. I am definitely confused. I successfully run programs on this basic with no issues. So to do the 900 baud mod, what we have to do is on the CPU board here, this is the clock generator that generates the different frequencies for the different baud rates. It's these pins right here that carry those square waves. I'm pretty sure they come from this IC and they're buffered by that chip. So if we look down right here on the motherboard, it actually shows that 600 baud is the second pin over the second pin on this connector right here. I'll never use that particular baud rate, especially because it's, it's so non-standard. And it goes from there up to that IC. And it's probably this, this line right here that goes to there. Right here in the Switbug user guide from Southwest Technical Products Corporation, is a little guide on how to actually uh, go to a higher baud rate. So there is an extra baud, it's MPAIC4 pin one. It's right here, it is that clock generator chip and that is the buffer chip IC14. And here is the data sheet for that buffer chip. And we saw that the 600 baud here comes in from that clock generator chip, it gets inverted and it comes out pin four. And here's the 600 baud line, there it is, pin four and there's pin three coming up here to the clock generator. So I'm gonna cut that trace and we're gonna connect that up to pin one. And there it is, there's that bodge from pin one to pin three of the buffer. And then pin four comes out and it goes to the 600 kilobits per second pin on the motherboard. All there is to do now is turn off pin five, which is 1200 bits per second and switch on pin four, which is 600. And back in TerraTerm, we're just gonna switch this from 1200 to 96. And now let's turn this on. Oh, look at that, we got a dollar sign, which means it's working, I think. Let's uh, hit the R key for register. Look at that, nice and quick, amazing. There are a few settings in TerraTerm like the paste delay line. I have it set for 10 milliseconds. And under the serial port, there's both a character delay and also a transmit delay for the lines. If I find I try to copy and paste those S records to load a program and it has a problem, maybe increasing this character delay might help a little bit, but I'm just gonna leave it at zero, zero for now and see how it goes. That loaded very, very quickly. And with these Motorola S records it does have a checksum. So if one of these lines was say, missed a character or whatever, it would actually error out on the load process. And here we go, let's try, give it a try. 32,000, terminal width 80, no. Okay, print, hello. Okay, <laughs> now it worked. Uh, let's try running a little program. Print Adrian's digital basement. I'll put that 20, go to 10. Look, it freaking works. All right, now control C should break out of this and it absolutely does. And it's working now. So I really don't know what was going on. I guess what's the difference here? Besides the baud rate change, which I don't think is the difference. Could it be the amount of free memory? Wasn't I typing in 30,000 before as opposed to 32,000? Is that somehow gonna create a difference? I, I really don't know. Now I had found and saved some basic programs that were written for this particular version of basic, which is like uh, the Microsoft basic, like the Commodore has basically. And if we open one of these, it's literally just the basic listing itself. Now let's try copying and pasting this in and see what happens. I read through the manual for this particular version of basic and when you push control O, it turns off the local echo and it's designed to basically load basic programs from paper tape where it just has a, a listing that is actually just typed in. And I think that's supposed to speed up the uh, ability of the interpreter to take that input in. So I'm gonna paste in this program here. I just hit control O and we're not gonna see anything. And I think it should be typing, 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 typing. I do know that if there's a syntax error, 
in the listing, then it will cause an error here. Now, I don't know if it's finished pasting because unfortunately TerraTerm doesn't really have a status screen. So let's just hit Control O and type list. Okay, clearly that did not work. It went too fast, I guess. There is definitely a speed limit for how quickly you can input stuff into this particular basic. So why don't we just try five milliseconds per character and we'll add 20 per line. All right, it looks like this speed obviously works. It's just, wait, no, it didn't even completely work. Look at this line right here. That was 170 rem somehow got turned into 11 rem. How did that even happen? It also dropped a character here on line 200 and it looks like it turned it into 22 somehow. Let's give it more time between each line, but let's turn down the, uh, the transmit inter character delay. So new, paste. All right, that seemed to work. I'm gonna make it 200 milliseconds per line. I'm gonna reduce the character delay to one. Okay, that's still working great. Let's change it to zero milliseconds per character. Too bad there's no fractional uh, inter-character delay. Okay, having that large delay between the lines, that seemed to do the trick actually. So let's just paste this whole thing in here. Let's see if this program can work here. I don't know, that actually didn't look right there. Okay, yeah, this definitely had problems here. Program's not very long, but I can see that some lines are a little screwed up. I'm gonna go back to one millisecond delay with 300 milliseconds per line. And let's just paste this in. I think this should work at this really slow speed. <laughs> now, wow, this loads. One of the particular problems it seems like with this basic interpreter is it doesn't really have any load and save functionality built in. The Southwest basic that they made actually does have a way to save and it outputs those Motorola S records, if I recall. And then you can load them back in the same way. I think with this one though, there just doesn't seem to be like a load or save command at all, or C save or C load, which would be, you know, for cassette or uh, paper tape. So I think the only way to really load and save programs on this is to actually load and save directly from memory. So I exit out of basic. So if we do list, there's the basic program. And if we hit run, I think this should work. Uh, no, this still aired out, list 490. 490 D2 equals D minus S. I can't believe that even at that slow speed, this still has problems. Like where did next S come from? 490 D2 equals D minus S. Uh, what is happening here? Why does it do that? D next S? Wow, okay. Maybe there's really a fault with this machine. I, I don't know at this point actually what's going on here. This is all pretty mysterious. I recorded some more footage of me struggling with this Altair Basic and then I tried a different version of Basic and it didn't work properly either. So clearly something is wrong with this computer. Even though those RAM tests we ran earlier seemed to say all the RAM was good, there's gotta be some kind of an issue. So I went to the data sheet to look at how the timing should work on the Motorola 6800. Now on my little RAM board, which I've added to the CPU card, I have to generate the chip select line for the SRAM chip. And the way I did that is I looked at A15, so address line 15, when that is low and phi two, which was one of the clock signals is high, then the chip select line that goes to that SRAM chip is low. I made sure that phi two must be high before the chip is selected because that's exactly how a 6502 processor would do it. I just assumed that the 6800 and the 6502 would be the same in that regard. For writing to the chip, the select logic is exactly the same, obviously, but there's just a read-write pin that goes into the SRAM that is driven low by the processor when it wants to save data to RAM. So let's take a look at the data sheet, figure two, reading data from memory. So this is a processor trying to read from RAM. And right down here is the most important part. This is where the data is valid. So in this little section here, if we go up to the top, you'll see that clock two, which is what I call phi two, has to be high, which is exactly um, what I'm doing. And then we can tell here that the address lines coming from the CPU are indeed valid during that time, because remember, we're using A15 as a select line. There's also this line VMA, which I didn't take into account with my chip select logic, and stands for valid memory address. Now, of course, it doesn't really matter because if we look at the timing diagram, it is just high at the same time of phi two, and of course the address lines being valid. So the static RAM chip is gonna place the correct data on the bus as soon as phi two goes high, which is about here. And because it's very fast SRAM, it's gonna actually place data on the bus during this entire section. 
The reason why the data valid on this diamine diagram starts over here is because this thing was designed when RAM was slow. And what this is telling you is the processor is actually looking for valid data when Phi 2 goes low. Well, luckily the way I designed this memory card tells us that the valid memory will be there when this goes low. Now let's take a look at the writing diagram. Everything here is relatively similar. So there is clock two. So remember when this goes high and the address bus is valid, then that chip is gonna be selected. And for writing into the chip, the read write pin needs to be low before the chip is selected. So we know that's gonna happen because the chip is gonna be selected right about here. The VMA or valid memory address pin just seems to be high during the entire time anyways. And when we look down here, data from the MPU, there seems to be a little bit of a potential delay right here, but it's really hard to tell from the timing diagram. Now remember this SRAM is gonna get selected as soon as this goes high. And when we scroll down here, it seems to be in the general vicinity of the valid data. I have to look at the data sheet for the SRAM, but I'm pretty sure that it actually saves into the memory when the chip is deselected. So that'll be right about here, which when we take a look by going down here, you'll notice that data should be valid when the chip select disappears for this datagram chip. So looking at these two timing diagrams, looks like I did everything right on the memory card, even though I'm not looking at this VMA signal, the data always should be valid when either reading or writing from the chip, but clearly something is wrong. Not really knowing where to go next, I took a look at some schematics for memory boards on this machine, and I noticed that they are taking into account this VMA signal or valid memory address in the select logic. So because I had an extra AND gate on my little memory board, I changed the chip select logic for the SRAM to make sure that VMA must also be high when it's reading or writing. And even though according to the timing diagrams, that doesn't seem like that's gonna make any difference whatsoever, would you believe the computer now works perfectly? I think basically what's happening here is the timing diagrams on this data sheet are just not good because when we take a look at what it says for VMA, it does say that in normal operation, you should use this signal for enabling peripheral interfaces such as the PIA and ACIA. Well, basically if you're selecting any type of peripherals, including RAM, on the bus, you need to be looking at this VMA signal. If anyone watching is familiar with the 6800 and can tell me why using VMA is required for stable operation of the computer, I'd love to understand why, because I certainly still can't tell from just the data sheet. All right, after making that modification to the RAM upgrade board, this machine definitely is working really well now. Let's uh, run some software on it. All right, so first off, let's try this Altair basic again. I shouldn't have to type any particular size for the memory. I should be able to hit enter. Hi, look at that. It totally worked. Terminal with 80. Sure, we'll do yes on those. There it is. 26,331 bytes free. 20, go to 10. And it actually works. No crashing, no fuss. It's working properly. And here I have a little small program here that does like a 3D plot. So first of all, let's just try this. Now, control O should allow me to paste this and it won't echo the characters as it sends it. So let's let that paste in. Now, I don't have any character delays set for the terminal program. It's sending at full speed. There we go, list. Oh, it didn't work. <laughs> okay, so clearly you do need a little bit of delay. I hadn't tested with this exact setup quite yet. I think the biggest problem is actually the line delay. So I'm gonna put in like, I don't know, 100 milliseconds there. And I think that worked, although this last part does not look correct. And if we look at the original file, one, two, three, five, 100, hmm, what is that last line there? That's weird, let's just do that. Okay, whatever, let's hit run. And there it goes, it's running the 3D plot. Now I used this particular program um, and what it does is it runs one time and then it will just terminate. Well, I altered the program so that it doesn't terminate after one run and it just loops and runs indefinitely. And I left this running on this machine for maybe six hours and it didn't crash. It worked the entire time. It just worked perfectly. As you can see there, it plots a little 3D curve thing on its side, kind of cool list. There it is. All right, there we have it. A working Southwest Technical PC 6800 machine maxed out with 48K of RAM. Now, 
After fixing the RAM boards, this machine, as I mentioned, is totally stable, and I've been using it, running all sorts of little basic programs and stuff. I do have some issues with Terra Term. It seems that it doesn't do a good job pasting. It loses characters for some reason. But on the other hand, Minicom on a Raspberry Pi seems to work just fine. So I'll stick to using that. I still haven't tested out that disk drive card, but that's really because I just don't know where in memory that card resides. And now this thing is maxed out with 48K, uh, it's probably overlapping with some of that memory. And until I can actually find definite instructions on that particular card, I don't think it's really going to do much for me in this machine. Not to mention all the various disk software that exists for this computer was designed for the disk controller that SWTPC themselves made and not the smoke signal broadcasting uh, one that I have. I also went ahead and ordered a couple cards for the machine here. I have an SD card system. So this is an SD card reader that plugs into the parallel port on that thing. And I think I'll need to replace the ROM and this can emulate the disk drives. And I also have a new serial card for this machine. It replaces the one that's in there and actually provides a USB port so I can plug a Raspberry Pi directly into this thing without needing a little USB serial adapter, which incidentally, only very specific USB serial adapters work. I have a really old one I have that works fine with this. All of my newer ones do not work. And I think it's because the levels that this card accepts or expects aren't right coming from the USB adapters that wants that negative 15 or negative 12 volts or whatever. Right here, what you see is it's plugged into the serial port directly on my PC. So watch for a future video where I give these things a try and uh, make this thing a little bit cooler. Anyhow, that is gonna be it for this video. If you thought my hack and slash mods I did on these boards was too much and I shouldn't have done any of that, definitely let me know in the comment section below. Or if you thought that these bodges and mods that I did were period correct, and not so bad, then uh, yeah, let me know as well. I wanna thank my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. If you wanna become a patron, you can do so as well. And I do wanna mention I have a merch store, so there's a link in the description below. I'll actually have some t-shirts to show off soon on the channel. That'll be the official launch. I think it's been a bit of a soft launch up until this point. And I guess that is gonna be it. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.